Hi, everybody, and welcome to LA City View Channel 35 Studios in beautiful downtown LA's Little Tokyo. My name is Gil Reyes. Honored to be here with our own Los Angeles City Attorney, Mike Fear. Great to be with you, Gil. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we were out in the, in the lobby last week, and when I mentioned to you we would be talking for a few minutes, you said, well, let's turn it into a cooking show. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? We may have recipes to discuss later, so we're <laughs> on a roll here. Food is very important to a lot of people. That's right. And so is internet privacy. Uh, recently, your office filed a lawsuit against uh, the Weather Channel app and IBM over allegations that it took users' information without their permission and sold it to third parties, uh, advertisers, marketing companies. You know, you know, the question about how all of us can maintain our privacy in this digital age is among the most important issues that consumers confront. Uh, and we're trying to grapple with it in the wake of recent revelations, news reports from various newspapers around the country that have chronicled the erosion of privacy. For example, uh, back in December, there was an expose in the New York Times that noted how many of the mobile apps collect information, including the locations of their users 24-7, and then share it with third parties. It was a very chilling discussion. Um, we began to conduct an investigation of our own, and we focused on the Weather Channel app because it is both a very widely used app and because we thought that their practice at the time was particularly problematic. When one downloads the app, there's that initial pop-up page that asks you for permission to share your location. And at the time, the Weather Channel app's uh, pop-up said, we use this information, and I'm going to paraphrase, uh, for personalized weather data, like personal forecasts and such. Mm -hmm. The user at that point, by allowing access to locations, suddenly can use the app without more. What we allege in our complaint is that the user was not made aware that their personal location was not being used exclusively for that purpose, but rather to be shared with third parties. Now, what does that look like if, in general terms, if one's information is shared with, thir with third parties? The New York Times expose discussed how this could get in the hands of all kinds of third parties, not just advertisers. There was a more recent discussion in the LA Times about how that information, in general, could get in the hands of political campaigns. Um, now, I don't know, in the, or hedge funds, by the way, or others. I don't know yet, because we're still in the process of learning information, about in whose hands the Weather Channel app was providing, was getting that information. I don't know exactly to whom it was directing that. We're going to find out. Um, but let's look at that for a second. If one's location is being given to a third party, that means third parties can know whether you're going to a therapist or an abortion clinic or an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting or where you worship. Uh, this is private information. Users, on my view, should be able to make the choice to share that information, but it better be an informed choice. Now, just within a few weeks of the filing of our lawsuit, the Weather Channel app, which through IBM, which is its parent, had originally said, oh, our privacy disclosures are more than adequate, then changed that first page so that it sh now discloses more about how they share, they may share information with third parties. Uh, that's a start. But for our purposes, it's really important not only to look at this case, but to look at it in context. There is a national conversation about privacy underway right now. In Sacramento, there's major privacy legislation that is in the midst of being negotiated and implemented. In Washington, same thing is true. Uh, so we think we're on the cutting edge of something very important with this lawsuit in our role here as protecting consumers on issues that are really significant to them. There's a state law expected to kick in in 2019, right? And right. then on top of that, other bills uh, pending, possible. Uh, and then you have uh, some companies that are trying to block this. Uh, I'll give you one example of why this would irk a lot of people. It gets in the way of a lot of good intentions. Uh, recently, the mayor's office with the city's information technology agency, they launched this earthquake warning app right. called ShakeAlert. And for it to work, you have to set your location settings on. I know people who are reluctant to download a, that app because of fear of improprieties like the ones you helped expose. Right. And, and let's separate issues completely. Mobile apps typically have, as part of their economic model, 
the need to share information with third parties. Uh, and they, we're, we're still looking at the Weather Channel app as to what benefit it derived from that sharing. But in general, there is an economic benefit that many apps derive from that sharing. In the case of the, the city's earthquake shakeout app, no, none of that is true. And from my standpoint, it's really important for users to be able to take advantage of an earthquake app, which wants your location for one reason alone. We need to know where you are in the event of an earthquake to determine how much damage you might be incurring if you're going to stay there. And to give you a warning as to where, you know, at that moment, since earthquakes have different impacts depending upon your physical location at that moment. Completely different from the Weather Channel app uh, challenge that we've raised. The thing is, though, a lot of people don't know the difference. Yeah. So uh, until these laws kick in, is there a way that people can protect themselves? Well, this is the thing. I think federal law should be bolder. Now, we're enforcing existing rules, and we've alleged that the Weather Channel app violated existing laws. But as a broader matter, we think that federal policies should change. The collection of data should be for much more narrow purposes. Users should be able to control their data much more readily. It should be much more secure from the potential for being hacked, for example. Um, those changes could, if Congress had the will, be enacted in a way that struck an appropriate balance. Because again, many users would say it's okay with me to share my personal location with this app in exchange for the service that I'm receiving. But there has to be very clear notice and consent for that situation to work well. You mentioned clarity. It's tough to go through that contract in the pop-up screen. Lots of times those words are just too long. If they can condense it to one page, most people are hurrying to download an app or play a game. Right, right. And, so and you know, in the case of the Weather Channel app, one could download the app without ever even adverting to, for example, their privacy policies. Other apps are different. Uh, the Cities app, as I understand it, for the earthquake shakeout, um, you have to go through a series of disclosures before you can actually use the app. So ideally, one would be cognizant of any issues associated with that app. That was different in the case of the Weather Channel, we've alleged in our complaint. Okay. All right, well, moving on. Yes. Uh, <laughs> very good. I really appreciate your candor on this. Um, anyone that follows Los Angeles politics knows right now that the FBI is currently investigating possible, we have to say possible, uh, corruption within LA city government. You mentioned several names in the search warrant, several top names, and some of the scary words involved are possible bribery, uh, money laundering, and extortion, uh, involving development projects in downtown. As the city attorney, do you have a response to the sort of innuendo that's going on right now? You know, at every level of government, here and abroad for that matter, there is, I think, a widely shared view that we can't necessarily trust what our leaders are saying and doing. That is so corrosive, Gil, because when people think that they can't have faith in the integrity or quality of their government, then they don't vote. They back away from the process. Great candidates don't choose to run. In the case even of donors, donors may decide uh, that they feel the need to donate, not because they're inspired by a candidate or official, but because they think that they need to. Um, each of those results would be horrible. And I think it's incumbent on all of us in office to be displaying in very clear ways that we believe integrity in government is essential. We need to be exemplifying what that means in our words and in our actions all the time. Uh, one of the key reasons that I've been, that I've chosen to be in public service for many years is I want to inspire that faith in the quality and integrity of government. I want people to be more energized and active, to be participating in the political process. And for them to feel it's worth it, they have to feel at the same time that the government they have is the government that they deserve. And I think people deserve to have a government that works for them and has no other motivations. I know people that are up with government in fairly recent years have decided to tax themselves to uh, build homeless housing, right. to uh, extend the transportation projects. And even if the allegations aren't true, right, uh, just the thought of something like that, that their money is, putting, is being put to other uses, it just puts a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Well, it does. And, you know, some of those projects you're describing are extremely important here in the city. Um, when I was in the state legislature, I wrote the law that authorized what was called Measure R, which infused, because the voters chose to do it, 
about $35 billion into expanding our public transit network here. I was very proud of my role in that. But you're right, voters need to accurately believe that their resources are going for the purposes that they intended. Now, none of the allegations at the moment has anything to do with those initiatives, but it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, when you cut through all of this, there's one question that a voter has, can I trust my elected official? And the answer has to be yes. But we have to earn that. That isn't just given, that's earned. And I think in, right now in City Hall and at every level of government, we just saw that the, the Prime Minister of Israel is about to be indicted by its Attorney General. Uh, in Washington, there are issues of the same nature as there are, have been over the course of time in Sacramento. Uh, we have to do better, and I think we can. Councilman David Rue has uh, issued this proposal to ban developers of major projects from making co campaign contributions to city officials while their developments are being considered by the city. Is that something you think would be fair? Well, the question for me as the city attorney first was to make sure that such a proposal could pass legal muster. Um, the Ethics Commission has referred a proposal very much like that to the City Council for consideration. Uh, Mr. Rue has a very similar proposal to what the Ethics Commission has identified as its priority, and my office has been examining that proposal to be sure that it is, cre uh, that it is substantial, and at the same time to be sure that it, any challenge to it would lose, because we want to be sure if the Council enacts a law, it can stand up. Again, from my standpoint, not as city attorney making sure the law is legal, but just as a leader in Los Angeles, I know that there has been, since I was a city council member, a broad perception that in many cases developers get what they want because of campaign contributions. Um, I worked very hard as a city councilman with development projects to be sure that everyone knew it was just the merit of the project that defined where I was going to stand and nothing else. But I know that perception isn't always shared, um, certainly more in more recent years. So I think that the idea, and here's precisely what's on the table, if you have a pending application that requires a, dis a discretionary review by the city council during that period that you can't make a contribution to those who are deciding, exercising that discretion. Um, conceptually, that sounds right to me. Okay, uh, moving on. A little background sure. on you. Uh, you uh, are from San Bernardino, right. born and raised. Right. Uh, graduated for, with honors from Harvard University, Harvard Law School, former executive director of Betsetic Legal Service, right. uh, House of Worship. So. No, House of Justice. House of Justice. Yeah, and that's actually, you know, I, I'm glad that you mentioned my work at Betsetic. You know, I, I ran that organization for eight years. Some of the most important work in my life was done when I ran Betsetic. It says, it, the title of the organization is House of Justice. Betsetic means House of Justice in Hebrew. Because people came to us 50,000 times when I ran Betsetic because they were confronting the most difficult problem they'd ever faced. They were losing their house or their health care. They were being ripped off in some consumer scam. They were Holocaust survivors seeking restitution from the German government and they would come with a stencil in their arm from the time that they spent in a concentration camp. They had nowhere else to turn and they had no money. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were in that situation, if my house were on the line or my health care were on the line and I had no nickels to, to get a, a lawyer, I would feel this is the biggest crisis in my life. And at Betsetic, to be able to reach out to our clients and say, we're here for you, we don't want any money from you, we just want to vindicate what's just and to save people's homes and to prevent people from being unlawfully evicted and from making sure people have the health care they're entitled to and doing an array of other programs that change the lives of our clients forever. It was one of the most fulfilling things I have ever done. And the reason I went to law school, you know, I went to law school because it seemed to me that if one knew the law, one could lift up people who had no one else, give them a voice, whether it was purely as a lawyer or as a public official. And at, that proved to be true, but Beth Sedek really got me started at the very earliest stages of my career in that direction. And that was then you decided, during that time, I want to go into public service. Well, you know, it's interesting. When, when I was at Beth Sedek, as you mentioned, I was there for eight years, and then the city council member for my district, uh, Zev Yaroslavsky was at the time, uh, was running for the Board of Supervisors and was leaving his city council seat. Um, 
at that SEDEC, one of the things that I had really pushed forward was to have us not only help people with individual legal cases, but also do larger impact cases and, when appropriate, pursue legislative change in Washington, in Sacramento, or here in City Hall. When that possibility of that seat opened up, you know, I said to myself, you know, it is great to be advocating for those changes on behalf of our clients, but it'd be another thing to be able to decide the outcomes, to be able to enact those laws myself. So I took a big risk, and I, I left that SEDEC, uh, and I walked door to door for months, running in a race that most people assumed I would not have a chance to win because I ran against very prominent, famous people, uh, but I won. And so that started me off in my career as an elected official. That was the fifth council district. Correct. And you served there for seven years. For uh, Yes, I was at six years. Six as a, years. Six years as a city councilman. Um, I ran for office and I ran for re-election. It went great. I didn't have any opposition. I was the chair of the budget committee for the city and very deeply involved in a vast array of issues that affected many of the clients I cared about at Betsetic. Senior citizens, kids, um, but also looking at broader issues in the city. How do we make sure that our residents can be on safe streets, that our sidewalks are safe, that our trees are trimmed, that our potholes are filled? How do we make sure we have recreational opportunities everywhere in the city? You know, what's the relationship between the city and the school district? I created a program uh, with the LAUSD and the community colleges to help with literacy for kids when they are in elementary school because we know if kids don't start off knowing how to read, it impairs their abilities for the rest of their lives to get a good job and, and have a good future. Uh, I found the city council to be such a rewarding place because I could paint on a very broad palette. I decided that it was very important not to limit my role to making sure things were going well in my district. That was fundamental to my job, but I also wanted to be a leader in the city, and I was found I was able to do that. Okay. We'll talk about one of the programs you want to resurrect called Shoulder to Shoulder. Yes. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Great. Um, and then after that, you went to the state assembly. I think a lot of people, when you say the name Mike Fear, they automatically think gun control. You authored the micro stamp gun law, which leaves an imprint on shell casings so that you can easily uh, more trace them back to the shooter if and when a crime occurs. That's, that's one thing. And then you co-chaired Prosecutors Against Gun Violence. Right. But tell us about that. Sure. Well, let's take a step back for a second. It's too easy to have sort of an antiseptic conversation here in the studio about gun violence. I, I, I want to take our viewers to a little different level here. When I was on the city council, two different events sparked my interest in being a leader on gun violence, not just here, but across the country. Uh, one was when there was a shootout in the valley, uh, when a bank robbery was occurring, and the robbers had more high-powered weaponry than LAPD did. Later, the North Valley Jewish Community Center shooting happened, where a racist anti-Semite went on a rampage and shot a Filipino-American postal worker simply because he was a person of color, and then he went to the school and he gunned down kids. And I, it's a, for me, a very poignant moment for me because I was on the city council. I, I heard about that shooting. I made sure my own kids were safe. It was a summertime event. And then I went to the scene, which was in the North Valley, as I mentioned. I went past the police tape, and I found out that a little boy, five years old, had been shot, same age as my daughter was at the time. And as an elected official, you know, that's, there's not a big public moment there. I went to the hospital and sat with his parents in a little tiny waiting room just to see if their son would live through the surgery to save his life. And once you do that, the issue of trying to combat gun violence takes on a whole different cast. It's not just some sterile conversation. This is about making sure that no other kid has to suffer that way. So on the city council, I was very proud to write most of the city's most significant laws to prevent gun violence, some of which became the catalyst for changes at the state level. But you asked about prosecutors against gun violence. So when I was in Sacramento serving, representing LA in the state legislature, I learned something. Every lawmaker, Republican or Democrat, on every bill gets a piece of paper from their caucus staff. And a paper says, here's what the bill is, here's what it does, here's who's for it, here's who's against it, and here's the recommendation we make for how you should vote on it. I noticed that in that who's for, who's against analysis, Republicans might care more about the Chamber of Commerce or Democrats might care more about, about an environmental group, but everybody cared what prosecutors thought about a given issue. 
So now I'm the Los Angeles City Attorney. I was elected, and I, I called the District Attorney of Manhattan, Cyrus Vance Jr. And I said to him, you know, prosecutors across the country have not clearly spoken with one voice about the importance of combating gun violence. There are many other voices in that room, but we're uniquely situated. We're credible across both you know, the whole, whole ideological spectrum. We have credibility, and we have a unique perspective because of our role in the justice system. There should be a voice of prosecutors in our individual jurisdictions, in our states, and in Washington, D.C. So we brought together this coalition of prosecutors. Now there are dozens across the country. It's a nonpartisan organization. These are prosecutors who are devoting ourselves to making sure that laws change to advance public safety and to making sure we're engaging in best practices in our own jurisdictions. And it's had momentum that I'm extremely proud of. One of the key issues that many of your viewers might care about is domestic violence. In Los Angeles, when I became city attorney, I found out the following. Domestic abusers, I knew, weren't allowed to have access to guns. But there was no system in place to make sure that they didn't have access to weapons. And boy, is that a volatile combination. If someone is in the middle of getting a temporary restraining order against somebody and that other person has a weapon, it's horrible. We know, for example, that in domestic violence cases, if the perpetrator has a gun, the other person, typically the spouse, the female, is 500% more likely to die. So we made sure right away, working, I created a gun violence prevention unit in my office, and Greg Dorfman, a great member of my staff, headed that. And we created a system under Greg's leadership that assured that no one who has, it was a domestic abuser in a criminal situation, would have a gun. We worked with the LAPD and the court system. So then, through Prosecutors Against Gun Violence, we worked with a national organization called the Coalition for Risk-Based Firearms Policy and created a report, a template, for how every jurisdiction in the country could get guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. This happened when President Obama was in office. The White House tweeted our report. I was then invited to come to the White House and speak to a group of lawmakers from across the country. I was on a panel with a governor and a mayor of another city, all talking about what local leadership can bring to the issue of preventing gun violence in the absence of federal action, which, as you know, has been pretty much put on hold. So yes, an extremely important issue to me. After Parkland happened, I convened a blue ribbon panel on school safety here in Los Angeles because my kids who were public school kids here in LAUSD, I know what it's like to be a dad in the public school system. I know how important it is to parents that, there's kids be, that their kids be safe. And in the wake of Parkland, we created a, a report with 33 recommendations. Some have been in place. Others need to be implemented by the school board. And I hope your viewers will help propel that forward so the school district identifies this as a top priority. Mm -hmm. You mentioned those 33 recommendations. They were brought together from a lot of people contributing, law enforcement, people in public health, people in mental health, right. over weeks or months, because I remember we were airing your yes. meetings. Yes. <laughs> uh, there were 33 recommendations. I think one of them was to create sort of a czar for uh, school safety. That was one of them. Yeah. You know, my theory of leadership is on any major project, any major issue, someone's got to be in charge. You know, point person who is accountable, who works in a transparent way to deliver whatever is on the table with milestones so the public can assess progress toward meeting those objectives. Now, the school district, we learned in our hearings that you telecast, has many silos when it comes to safety. Um, Architecture and design of schools matters when it comes to safety. Mental health and social services matter for public safety. Uh, law enforcement matters to public safety, but they didn't always integrate well. And so we propose there be one person overseeing all of that because safety has got to be a top priority for the school district. Now, the district responded to our report by naming its school's police chief to be in charge of school safety. Is that good enough for you? Well, I was going to say, so Steve Zimmerman is the chief of police for the schools. We work very closely with his office and very effectively, I would say. For example, when kids bring guns to school that haven't been safely stored at home, our teams are seamless in assuring that the kids are safe and that the adults are prosecuted, not to be punitive, but because we have to send the message that's very important here in the city that if you have a gun, you need to keep it stole, uh, stored safely at home. The major source of crime guns in our city is lost and stolen guns. Kids get access to guns. People who want to commit suicide can get access to a gun, all of which, if they're stored safely, none of those problems will arise. If they're not stored safely, they could all become problematic. Anyway, 
the chief was charged with being in charge of school safety. My view is he's a great person, he's a great leader, but he already has a day job. It's a full-time day job. And the aspects of school safety that I referred to earlier, from design to mental health, as well as, as the police chief's role, compel, on my view, oversight of, from someone who doesn't already have a full-time commitment to one facet of that problem. And so that position will be created, or do you think so? That we're still pushing the school district to create it uh, in the way that I think is the most responsive to the real needs the district has. You know, the school district is often looked to by other jurisdictions as an example uh, for safe schools. It's also the case that with the stakes this high, we need to be pushing to do everything we can possibly do. And I think we can do more. And that's why I'm pushing the district to try to expand on its efforts so far to implement our recommendations. You don't like wanding students coming into class, and you're not into uh, metal detectors either on campus. You don't think those work? Well, this is a very interesting issue. So the school district has, for a long time now, randomly wanded with a metal detector students who were pulled out of class for that purpose. Uh, again, my own kids endured that themselves when they were in school. Now, on the one hand, all of us want to deter any kid from bringing a weapon on campus. On the other, more weapons have been confiscated from student reports than ever through the wanding process. The most likely item to be confiscated from wanding is like school supplies that people aren't supposed to have, that kind of thing. Um, trust is a key. If kids are trusting of the adults on campus, it of course improves the academic performance they have, but it also gives them the space to be able to report to someone, you know, this individual might have a weapon on campus, do something about it. Kids who don't trust their, lead, their adults will never do that. In our panel presentations, we heard many students and teachers express real concerns about the wanting process. So our report recommends analyzing it, suspend the program, and audit it to see if it's actually having its intended effect, given that most weapons confiscated at school come from other sources altogether. And given that there's been a lot, of, especially from kids of color, who say this erodes the kind of confidence I want to have in adults on campus. Um, the district hasn't chosen to do that yet, uh, but I think there is real merit in making sure the program is working for its intended purpose before we perpetuate a program that could undermine relationships between kids and teachers and other administrators. I don't think I've heard that before yet. The fact that you, uh, the kids have to t trust the adults and vice versa. Very important. And that whole idea of them coming into class and being sort of, I don't know, almost like a, a military type of uh, uh, big brother sort of look at those kids uh, would probably get in the way of their learning. Well, and, and this is the thing, you know, and, and to talk about that trust for, for a second, one of the recommendations in our report is that is, is one that arose actually from my national gun violence work. Uh, through that organization, Prosecutors Against Gun Violence, I was in Kansas City for a summit. And I met the leader for psychology for the Denver School District. She had been a student at Columbine when that tragedy occurred. That inspired her to go to become a psychologist and to return to Denver schools. Or, and so that's where she's in charge now. She said, in our schools, we make sure that on every campus, every student has a relationship of trust with an adult. It could be a coach or a custodian or a teacher or a dean or another administrator, but some relationship of trust because we know that that isolated kid that is more likely to be victimized by bullying or something else and also occasionally more likely to perpetrate violence because they're so isolated and don't feel any attachments on campus. One of our recommendations is LA should adopt the same approach. Every kid has at least one relationship of trust with an adult. It would deter violence, it would insulate those kids from problems that they confront, it would improve academic performance and the campus atmosphere generally. That's one of the 33 recommendations. Correct. Wow, That's right. okay. Um, crime in Los Angeles is down, but there are pockets in South LA where gun violence or the uh, fear of gun violence is prevalent, particularly in South LA, right off the 110, uh, in certain neighborhoods. Uh, LA Times really recently came out with this article. It was called Surrounded and uh, talked about some of the statistics. There's Dimoli High School on 88th Street in San Pedro. 105 people killed within a one mile radius of the campus over the past five years. 
Now, this is when everyone's saying crime is down, which it is, but in certain pockets, South LA, second place, Hawkins High School, 59th Street in Hoover, 75 people killed within a one mile area over the past five years. Not all of those are gun related, but I'm gonna guess some of them are. And even if the kids aren't injured, aren't shot at, it leaves an imprint in them that could limit their learning, limit their relationships. And as you pointed out uh, in a recent message with Mike segment, uh, society in general, because these are our future. Right. You, know, you actually set that up very well, Gil, by describing that impact. When I was on the city council, I worked to have therapists roll out to the scene of domestic violence incidents with LAPD because the science in those days was those kids who are witnesses or victims of violence are counterintuitively more likely to perpetrate violence as they get older, absent some timely and effective intervention. But the brain science has evolved substantially. And now we have a pretty clear picture that kids who suffer through trauma induced by gang violence or gun violence or domestic violence at home in any kind of sustained way are very likely never to have their brains develop the way they were biologically destined. We as adults, when we leave them to process the impact of that violence for themselves, we impair their futures forever. I mean, picture what that means. That means that one's child is never going to be who she or he were biologically intended to be because adults have failed to organize their neighborhoods and make them safe. So this creates a real imperative from my standpoint. Um, and by that brain science, by the way, is just so utterly clear now. What happens is that kids' minds get over, the, the, the aspect of brains that grapples with stress gets overstimulated. And when that overstimulation happens, there's a chemical imbalance that occurs and there's abnormal neurological development that occurs. Here's how that manifests itself. Kids become hypervigilant. They think the whole world is dangerous and they tend to respond, sometimes in violent ways, to what their minds are telling them is this incredibly stressful, dangerous situation. Uh, focus on daily tasks is very hard. Attachments of trust with adults and peers, very hard to come by. You know what those symptoms most closely mirror? The post-traumatic post post stress, yeah. stress syndrome that veterans of war experience and we're subjecting our kids typically untreated to that same battery of problems so we've created a project it's a pilot project um, in south los angeles we chose as our first location for this project watts it's about a 2.2 square mile area there were in 2018 93 shots fired calls there we want to choose a location where there are lots of calls for service based on gunshots we then partner with a group called the Children's Institute. It's a marvelous nonprofit that conducts therapeutic interventions with kids, LAPD, and community advocates in schools. Now, in that area, when there's a shots fired call for service, LAPD rolls out with a Children's Institute therapist and a community advocate. They're looking for kids. Were kids victims, were kids witnesses, or even cognizant that the shooting took place? When they find kids, they talk to their parents and say, you know, can we offer immediate therapy to those children and longer term therapy all for free? Then the team comes back the next day looking for the same number of, of kids and talking to their parents too. The goal, within 24 hours of a shots fired call, any child who was cognizant of the shot being fired should be offered that therapy. It's already showing meaningful promise because we couple this with community education and training because most parents don't know what to look for, signs of their, of their kids might be suffering from these problems. Most teachers don't know what to look for. LAPD hasn't known what to look for and so on. We've conducted several dozen training sessions now in this partnership with the community and with schools there because sometimes kids who are behaving in ways that might be suggestive of this problem, might be misdiagnosed as having attention deficit disorder, for example. And what a, what a mistake that would be. We think if we can intervene with these kids in a timely way, we can interrupt what otherwise would be a process that would erode their brain development forever. Now, it's early. We haven't developed metrics by which to assess our efficacy. It's only a few months old, but it's on the right track. And I'm just communicating over the weekend with Laura Drino, a great member of my team who runs this project, Already we're looking at expanding it dramatically throughout the entire Southeast Division to many of the areas around the schools you just mentioned because every kid should have the ability to develop to the best of their biological potential. 
And none of us should ever just be sitting idly by watching while some kid's future is imperiled. Mm -hmm. We uh, raise a lot of issues and uh, call to mind about attention deficit disorder in veterans, as well we should, people coming back from Iraq, even going as far back as Vietnam, the ones that are with us still. Uh, and we're very concerned about their mental health, but here we're talking about mental health of kids in our city. Right. Uh, and these are kids that could grow up and perpetuate violence themselves. From yes, see these are, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's post-traumatic stress syndrome that looks like this. And the thing is, um, we should be thinking of these kids as our kids, no matter what neighborhood of the city we live in, these are our kids. And that's the approach I want our office to take on any problem, whether it's in Woodland Hills or Arlita or Boyle Heights or South LA or Westwood or Venice. These are our kids, these are our neighborhoods. And I, you know, we have this very robust neighborhood prosecutor program. And they're also involved now in grappling with the issues that we're talking about. They, they're going to work very closely with Laura and others to try to abate the violence we're talking about in the first place. That's our big goal, right, is to have less violence in the first place. Um, but in all these instances, my view is we need to be getting every neighborhood the kind of service that each of us would feel is commensurate with living in a first-class city. And that's true about violence. It's true about grappling with homelessness. It's true about making sure our sidewalks are fixed and our streets are repaired. This is the basket of things that people have fair expectations from city government about. We should live in a safe city where homelessness is not the disgrace it is now. We should live in a city that works for us when it comes to making sure our sidewalks are passable and our streets are in good shape and our trees are trimmed. That's the kind of city all of us want to live in. On top of that program, you've developed a multi-pronged approach from the city attorney's office to keep neighborhoods safe or to help ensure that they're safe. Neighborhood prosecutor program, neighborhood justice program, neighborhood school safety. These involve community members to get involved uh, and you bring in prosecutors to the neighborhoods from your office to fi figure out where these problem areas are and make people who are uh, perpetrating these uh, crimes and discrepancies responsible and then you it's not enough for LAPD and you guys to go after them you make the community members make sure that th they're held accountable and help out the community as well so that's a facet of our of our office's work that hasn't been much discussed yeah. and I'm glad you raised it there's a lot of discussion now about criminal justice reform and that's a, itself a very big conversation one aspect of that from my standpoint is we need to be interrupting an escalating cycle of crime at an early stage. And because our office prosecutes misdemeanors, we have a chance to do that. Maybe we're best situated to do that. So I know that for most neighborhoods when a crime occurs, the justice system is way across town and they never see the impact of the intervention of that system in a way that helps improve any life on the street. So we created a wonderful program called our Neighborhood Justice Program. And here's how it works. We go to communities throughout Los Angeles and recruit now hundreds of volunteers. We train them in principles of restorative justice. Then they sit in panels of three, supervised by a trained mediator. And let's say you've committed a nonviolent offense for the first time in a neighborhood. Maybe you stole something. You would come in. That panel from the neighborhood where the crime occurred would begin to engage you. You were only there if you admit that you have some responsibility here. And so we say to you, we won't prosecute you if you finish this program. So you describe, the panels will ask you about your life, why you did what you did, have you taken responsibility for it? And then they'll say, look, some version of this. You know that crime you committed? It wasn't just that store owner who was a victim or that homeowner whose fence was vandalized or whatever. The community was suffering from what you did. And we're representing that community. And so we're going to define for you a community obligation that you must perform to help be accountable for what you did. And it might be tutoring kids or lecturing at the high school or painting out graffiti, a whole range of different prescriptions. And then we say, are there interventions that could be helpful here that might prevent you from repeating your offense later on? And it might be job training or counseling or something else. I can tell you something really important here. If we measure the success of the criminal justice system merely on conviction rate, we make a mistake. Because that incentivizes just doing easy cases, convicting a lot of people, they'll spend very little time in jail, and they're back on the street. That's why we have a huge recidivism rate, a huge rate of repeat offenses around the country. Crimes that we prosecute around the country, 50, 60% recidivism rates. In neighborhood justice, 
it's two to five percent depending upon the neighborhood. Think about that. Almost no one reoffends. And for us, that's a double win because that means we made the community safer by interrupting a cycle of crime in a way that almost no program has shown it can do. And we've shown we can start to turn around the life of the offender. And if we can do that, we transform someone from a criminal to a productive member of our community. The whole idea of thinking outside the box, that the cops can't do it on their own, you rely on the community also to help you well, guys out. Well, yes, exactly. And, and as you can tell from the array of programs we've been discussing, I want our office to have great vision, look around the corner about programs, ideas that could be cutting edge and really help change lives. But at the same time, we've got to be practical, roll up our sleeves, and actually make the community safer. Okay. Got to have a few minutes here. Sure. Uh, from neighborhood and school safety, I want to talk about racism in school and racism uh, in society in general. Uh, I heard, I'm heard. i sure you heard about those kids at Newport Beach that posed in front sure. of the swastika. Yes. Uh, and uh, it went viral. The whole idea of naturalizing Nazism. These are kids, young people who made mistake. They apologized. But uh, the numbers show, according to a Cal State San Bernardino study, that hate crimes are up in Los Angeles, the highest level in 10 years. Why do you think that is? I think right now in American society, there has been some normalizing of hate. When the president equates falsely civil rights advocacy with racism, as he did in the wake of the Charlottesville confrontation, it misses a key opportunity and sends a strong signal at the same time. The key opportunity is for leaders to identify ways to bring us together, not to say there were great people on both sides. And it does implicitly send the signal that we're not going to come down too hard on you if you engage in racist or anti-Semitic or homophobic or misogynistic uh, speech or action. So what do we have to do? It cannot be that the loudest voices, the most prevalent voices on social media or in public life are those who would divide us from each other. We all lose when that's true. So I want us to try to identify concrete ways for leaders to step forward and say we're better than this. And you had a program when you were a city councilman that you want to resurrect. Right. It's called Shoulder to Shoulder. You would bring kids from different schools, different backgrounds, different races together so that they can work on projects and learn to love each other. Well, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's the thing. The thing about Shoulder to Shoulder is a day of discussion, which we do now around race, issues of race and, and class and sex and so on, a day of discussion is a good thing, but there's no sustained benefit if it's only a day. And I learned long ago, what my first job in politics was to be in charge of issues when Tom Bradley, who was the first African-American mayor of LA, ran to be governor. When he was in City Hall, for the first time ever, he diversified the staff in City Hall, which enriched the discussion and made, I think, uh, it lifted up all the people who were in that administration. I know from people who worked there that they learned by working together with people very different from themselves about those other people as a byproduct of their collaboration to make the city better. So shoulder to shoulder, much the same thing. What I want to do is not only create some community service benefit from the project that kids are working on, but if they're working over a sustained period of time with each other, with kids they otherwise would never meet, it is far more likely that those kids are going to start to learn something special about other kids. And by learning about them, they're going to come to appreciate them and respect them. You know, we overuse the word tolerance in this discussion. I do not like that word in this setting because tolerance implies there's something about you that I don't like, but I'll live with it for the sake of harmony. Is that our highest aspiration? I don't think so. Not in the most diverse city in the world. We should be taking advantage of our diversity and using it as a source of enrichment and lifting each other up. That's what I think leaders need to do. Give us an example of how this would work. Would a kid from South LA team up with a kid from uh, the Valley, for example, at a, from a Catholic school. How, how would that work? Yeah, so you get these kids together. In fact, when I was on the city council almost 20 years ago, the, the initial project was the airport needed to have banners. And so the kids decided they would create banners that talked candidly about race. And these middle school kids had banners that would depict a kid uh, of one race saying, he thought about me some stereotype. Then the other banner on the other side of the pole would say, well, she thought, depicting a stereotype the other person might have. And then at the bottom, a message of reconciliation about that. You know, so so they, were, they were purposely provocative, expressing what kids were really thinking, but also having this unifying message associated with them. 
Um, so you could do that. You can imagine working on homelessness together. A whole array of projects might come to pass. My daughter, um, through our synagogue, when she was in high school, worked with a Muslim American uh, young girl uh, from a mosque, and together they formed a group of kids who, you know, Muslim Jewish group, which would work together on community service projects at a time when there were very tense relations between people of different groups. That's a model, I think, shoulder to shoulder, that kind of model we could all benefit from. City Attorney Mike Fuhrer, thinking outside the box, not just prosecuting people, but uh, you know, helping out with kids and doing things that you wouldn't necessarily think of to suppress crime. I really appreciate you being here. Gil, great to be with you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. We also want to thank you at home for watching. For LA City View Channel 35, I'm Gil Reyes. We'll see you next time.